just going to take you through a journey of uh, some of the things that we have done um, in, in our lab and our work. And um, I'll just start with the astonishing uh, success of machine learning. So uh, Piet Hott, who's an uh, astrophysicist, uh, said in 1977 that it'll be a, uh, a long time before a computer beats a human at Go. And, uh, and, and I think most of you know that in 2017, uh, a machine did beat the human champion at Go. And uh, he just said that, look, I was way off, and it was to totally stunning. But what I haven't got on the slide was uh, three weeks ago, a Nature paper, uh, they trained a machine, tabula rasa, no human in the loop, and it beat the other machine that beat the human in two days, and then it was so far ahead that, of course, nobody knows what it's doing now. So it's a little bit scary um, as to how well uh, machine learning is doing. And if you look at these two pieces of text, and I, and I took a poll around the room, I've done this several times, and it's impossible to know uh, which one was written by the machine and which one was written by a human. And in fact, 70% of written media, you'll be horrified to know, is written by a machine. <clears throat> so um, what I want to take you through is the journey that we've had on this sort of astonishing ride of machine learning and come to some of the things that we're doing today. So this is going back to 2005 when the London bombing happened. And the police asked a very simple question, did the bomber get off the bus? And they actually couldn't answer the question, even though they were like people who were monitoring the screens and they didn't know, it, but there were so many screens to monitor that it wasn't very clear which, which screen they should get at. And they also couldn't get to the actual road. So we realized that there was a problem when there's a lot of data. There's no point having a sensor if you can't do anything with it. And at that point in London, you couldn't go anywhere on the road without being monitored. But nobody could access that footage. So we realized that there was a problem in solving uh, this particular problem, which is machines that learn normal and identify abnormal. So we built this company called um, Isatana, which is uh, now quite a big uh, startup company. And I just want to share with you approximately what our solution was. So the solution that we provided was really a blank screen. So we said, no operator has to look at all the footage. The machine will tell them what to look at. Now, I'm not quite sure how to run this video. Um, yep, someone's running it for me. Yeah, there you go. So um, this, these are examples of abnormality that the machine detected. Uh, I, I want to stress that this is not trained by a human. So this, for example, is uh, a, a person who's stealing from a bin. Um, these are people who are loitering for a little bit longer outside a supermarket. Um, this is an example of a person going around the one-way street. And again, the human hasn't told the machine anything. It's learned normal and realized that this is a one-way street and nobody should be going in this particular way. Um, an example of uh, late night uh, trolleys and tags. So you've got this, uh, these guys coming in at night and now you watch them, they're gonna be doing a bit of graffiti on the ground over there. So, so the solution really here is that the, the human, you may have millions and millions of sensors, and how, does, how do you get a machine to learn what's normal and just tell a human that this looks a little bit abnormal, maybe you want to look at it. So we don't actually say it's abnormal, all we say is that this is an event which might be a precursor to something that might be abnormal. So that is the solution that we found, and it is a machine learning solution um, that we found for uh, solving this particular problem. The next one that I want to talk about is uh, a solution for children with autism. And we realized that when we were doing this piece of work, there were very long training times, for, uh, uh, very long waiting times for children to get therapy. So um, initially, we thought that we would just set up some resources for use by parents for therapy. But later on, we built this product, which became the, uh, which, which is called a Toby Playpad, and it's distributed through Autism West in, in Perth uh, through the iTunes store. And it essentially guides humans to accelerate learning for um, uh, accelerate learning for autistic children, so that they can adapt and learn faster. There are about 8,000 children who are using it worldwide. And through the data that's being collected, we can personalize the syllabus and adjust the way the stimulus is delivered so that these children can learn better. <clears throat> The next problem um, that we looked at is, um, can we predict uh, suicide risk? So when we started working with this uh, problem, 
what we found was that there was a lot of work that uh, the, uh, uh, when, when, when people have mental health problems, they go to the hospital, they're given a questionnaire of 20 horrific questions. One of them is, do you want to commit suicide? Do you have means to commit suicide? But at the end of this risk assessment, they get a score between one and three. And depending on that score, uh, the model of care is assigned to you. Now, when we went first to the hospital, they gave us that data and they said, can you go away and try and help us predict suicide risk better? That is, predict that in the next 30 days, this person is likely to commit suicide. So we took the data and off we went and we spent about six months on it and we couldn't find a single pattern. So what we then decided was to throw away their data and move from this, this kind of model where a person comes into the hospital, um, they, uh, they are given a risk assessment, and basically then are given a model of care. What we decided was to throw that data away and look at what is called the electronic medical records, which, which happens every time you go to a hospital, but you may not realize that it actually codes extreme, in extreme detail exactly what has happened. So for example, it says here yeah, this person came in February, uh, was ad admitted for high lethality poisoning, and so on and so forth. So they do this, by the way, not because they like to keep the data, but because they use it for billing. But this is the best data hospitals have. So we took this data and uh, we, we used it, and we used the same kind of method that we used for surveillance, which is instead of saying, are you sure whether this person is going to commit suicide, which is hard to do, we said, let's stratify it into risk. Let's get the top uh, riskiest of, uh, events, and if all the people who are committing suicide are in the top events, then pretty much you've done the job. So what we found is that, um, so what we said is basically they'll come into hospital, have their risk assessment, and, but we will take the electronic medical records. In parallel, we would use machine learning to try and come up with predictive models, and then we would try um, to give them a model of care. And we found that we were three times better than the clinic, clinical baselines. More importantly, the risk, the risk assessment tool that's being used now, even though it it's, it's, has to be done by law, actually has no pattern in it. So this is essentially uh, what we did. We had a lot of data. You need a lot of data to be able to do this. And essentially, we were able to um, show, you don't have to look at those graphs, but we were able to show that the algorithm was able to beat the, uh, the clinical baseline about three to one. Um, <clears throat> The next part of what we did was that we only had the data when the people came into hospital, but there's no data on them when they left the hospital. So what we then decided to use the social media as a, as a monitoring tool. So we're working with the Black Dog Institute here so we say, uh, so, uh, to collect the data that comes from social media so that we, can, we have the data when they're in hospital. When they're out of hospital, we have all their Twitter feeds and blogs and at least the people who are, who are working with us on a trial. And essentially what we want to do is we want to detect deviation from normal mood so that when we find out that a person has deviated from their normal mood, we, should, we, can, be, we, can, we can start to tell them uh, you know, there's some intervention that needs to happen. <clears throat> so we, we've done some initial work on being able to distinguish groups, but it's very early, early work yet. But one of the most interesting and exciting things I'd like to tell you about, and this is surprising to me that we, it can even be done, is disrupting how we innovate. So if you, if you think back in, uh, I think in the 12th centuries, Al-Hatam came up with the scientific method, which is really the basis of the design of everything. We basically experiment. So it, experimentation basically drives the scientific inquiry. But it's hard for us, oops, sorry, what was that? I just want to go back. Yeah, so experimentation drives um, scientific inquiry, but it's hard for us to know uh, what to change and how to uh, explore all possible combinations. What I mean by that is even if you're baking a cake, if you had to find a recipe for the cake, then you have a list of ingredients and you don't know how much of each you should put. Each time you, ch you, you mix something up, you taste the cake, you have to go back and do it again. As the number of control variables increase, it's almost impossible for you to explore all combinations. So essentially what happens is we, actually, we don't explore that many. So I always joke that that's why it's called the Bronze Age, because of all the elements in the periodic table, there's about 100. They've only mis mixed 12. Any current alloy has only 12 elements from the periodic table mixed in it. And that's because it's so hard to mix. So, um, oops, sorry, <laughs> I think we'll go forward. So, so the, this is the problem with uh, the curse of complexity. Even if you had 10 variables, um, uh, e uh, 
and you wanted to test uh, whether a car was crashworthy, each experiment takes 98 hours. That would take us 12 years to finish. So of course you could argue with me that that's not true because we drive safe cars, but actually what we do is we over-engineer and we really don't know how far from optimal we have. So adaptive experimental design is an interesting machine learning way to ex assist experimentalists to navigate this complexity of space. So we basically reduce the number of amount of time that, that, is, that it, take, it takes to make new products and processes. So with no human in the loop, except to do the experiment, we've designed new alloys, we've designed uh, new advanced nanofibers and new processes. And the applications of this are um, really just uh, limited by um, what um, our, our imagination is. So I guess this, this whole journey has taken up from the use of big data, which we used for solving problems like machine learning and uh, for solving problems in the hospital, to problems of lean data. So what we want to do now is take data where, that's one of the problems with machine learning, by the way, that we don't have a, uh, if you don't have a lot of data, we really don't know what exactly we should do. So what we want to do is take even spaces which have very little data and try to see how we can partner with the human in the loop to do something interesting as we've done in the case of those, uh, uh, in the case of this accelerating the scientific method. So maybe I, I stop at that point and thank you. <laughs>